So a couple weeks ago, there was this new teaser trailer that got posted to YouTube. You may have heard about this. It was for the new Thundercats show and it didn't go over super well. Among the complaints though, one seemed to stand out, which was railing against the show's art style, claiming it's too similar to how all other cartoons today look. And the people leaving these comments usually accompanied these with rose-tinted thoughts about how cartoons used to look their best back when they were kids. Seems like to everyone, no matter how old they were, cartoons were always at their very best when they were introduced to them as little kids. Funny how that works out. Anyway, I'm Jacob with Channel Frederator and yeah, we're doing this. Let's try to make sense of the speculation around the show's new look and see if these comments have any merit. Let's get one thing straight. This is not going to be a video of me complaining about a show I haven't seen yet. Besides, I'm not really the target audience for the show. This show was clearly made for a new audience with a historically marketable property. Wait. You don't know what a Thundercat is? <laughs> and I'm sure that by the time this video goes up, there are gonna be a whole bunch of other videos talking about exactly that. But for the sake of transparency, I don't really have an opinion of the show right now. Instead, let's focus more on the discourse that sparked around the show, specifically this pretty admittedly striking change in visual design that's come with the reboot and see if we can have a constructive discussion. As I showed you a little while ago, there's a lot of vitriol surrounding the new show. And honestly, a lot of it boils down to it's different and therefore I don't like it, which is a pretty common reaction to literally everything ever. But if you sift through these, a few pretty common arguments present themselves. The most prominent, of course, being against the visual design because this show looks like every other cartoon that's released these days. There's even been a surge of the term Cal Art style that's being used specifically to target these shows with similar character designs, from Thundercats Roar to others like Steven Universe, Gumball, Star Versus, you've all seen the comparisons. Some people have even gone as far to say that this is all a calculated move to push this art style for reasons that remain unclear, to be honest. You could say that today we're actually dealing with a literal cartoon conspiracy theory. The idea that the decisions made behind Thundercats Roar is part of some malicious plot to water down and homogenize the animation industry. All right, we're not really gonna focus on that part, but we are gonna focus on the comments about the animation style because there is a lot to unpack there. So let's take this one thing at a time. As with most things, the reasoning behind these decisions is a lot more nuanced than people like to act. But people generally aren't interested in these kinds of things. I mean, we're humans, we compartmentalize. We like to imagine that the world is a lot simpler than it actually is. And while we're hardwired this way, it's a very flawed way of thinking. After all, we're irrational creatures. Unless you're like that one guy who goes to parties and then kills every conversation by talking about how love is just electrical impulses traveling to the brain. This is why you aren't invited to my Memorial Day barbecue, Eric. I got a bit more fired up at Eric than I thought I was gonna. As far as Thundercats goes, let's start with the argument that is the best example of this kind of flawed thinking. That new buzzword, Cal Art style. Except, it's not new. At all. Among others, veteran of the industry, Rob Renzetti, who you may know as the creator of My Life as a Teenage Robot, has gone on record on Twitter saying that Cal Arts as a term of derision has been around since at least the 90s, denoting that there doesn't seem to be any specific style associated with that term. People just use it when it seems convenient to them. We reached out to animation historian Jerry Beck, who also teaches animation history at Woodbury University in Burbank, and yes, the California Institute of the Arts, who told us, Cal Art style 30 years ago meant a combination of Chuck Jones and Disney styles. Today, it's a combination of anime, primitive art, and shows like Chowder and Clarence. On top of the phrase not really meaning anything, it's worth mentioning that some of these shows that people insist are perfect examples of this sort of Cal Arts assimilation, like for example, OKKO OK and Steven Universe, weren't created by people who went to Cal Arts. What's more is that plenty of other working animators all over the industry are also graduates of Cal Arts. But over the years, they've all produced stylistically varied works that continue to inspire us today, just as the graduates of any animation school. Not to mention, uh, Oh, how do I say this without being rude? Um, that's not how schools work. All it takes is a quick look at what the students from Cal Arts are producing to see that this isn't some agenda being pushed. That's not to say that there isn't a problem here. The fact that people assume that all showrunners come from this school is indicative of a larger issue. To gain some more insight on this video, we also got in touch with animator Alex Crocus, who's worked on things like the Adult Swim show The Jellies, Hive Swap, Teen Titans Go to the Movies, among a whole bunch of other stuff. I'm gonna let him take over for a minute to vocalize his opinion on this. Okay, so it's undeniable that Cal Arts is a monolith 
in the animation industry and it mainlines and funnels its recent grads into all these highly coveted creative positions at Nickelodeon, Cartoon Network, DreamWorks, many different production houses in LA that are kind of just following this formula of uh, picking up recent graduates from a particular school. And it makes sense. I mean, there are a lot of professors and faculty who work in the industry that can open doors for these students. And that's great. There's a very talented student body in the school that deserves these jobs. Do I believe that CalArts should be the only household name in animation? No. Competition is good for industries and it's healthy if there are multiple institutions that are sharing the open doors into the industry. I think instead of attacking or stigmatizing this mythical Cal art style, we would just be better off putting pressure on the industry to scout for talent at other schools. It would lead to more educational diversity on the show, which would be good. Uh, people would approach problems differently and be able to share different experiences they have. People would have different theories about how to make a background, animate characters differently. There would be a different approach to telling stories. There would just be a finer blend of approaches to making cartoons if artists just came from different backgrounds. At this point, it should be clear that a show's art style is not dictated by where someone went to school. And besides, the whole thing with cartoons having similar visual styles has existed far longer than the Thundercats Roar trailer has. Let's go back to the beginning on this one. Have you ever gone back to watch TV cartoons from the late 50s, early 60s? I don't think it's unfair to say that a lot of these shows share some similar characteristics with one another. You'll find that many of these trailblazing shows were produced by companies like Hanna-Barbera and a handful of other companies. But you'll also find that every decision made that ended up with this visual style was done with purpose. As Mr. Beck told us regarding these stylistic choices, it wasn't really a choice. The higher theatrical budgets Hanna-Barbera were used to on the MGM Tom and Jerry cartoons weren't going to be feasible for television production a five-minute cartoon once a day or a half-hour show once a week, something had to take a hit, and that something was movement. Limited animation, fewer drawings, and lots of dialogue became the model. Getting the shows finished was more important than the niceties of Disney-style full animation. Loopholes were utilized to get around common problems. For example, have you ever wondered why cartoon characters from this time always seem to wear a collar or a tie or whatever around their neck? It's so that there's a clear dividing line between the character's neck and the rest of their body. That way, animators only have to worry about moving the head while the body remains static. This is a classic limited animation trick, and while yes, at the time it may have narrowed the design spectrum for the characters, it was these innovations that led to animation being viable for television at all. Mr. Beck also provided us with some info on why characters of this time all had much thicker line art than what we're used to today, a feature that would return in decades to come. He told us, The thick outlined characters of the 1950s was a design trend that United Productions of America started but adopted by TV cartoons cartoon creators because back in those days, over-the-air television reception was awful. The thick outline made it easier to watch on small, fuzzy, black and white TV screens. After a few decades and debate regarding morality and children's programming and advertising, the animation landscape of the 80s had ended up looking way different than the creator-driven mindset that had fueled the industry up until that point. Being run solely on ratings and trends had caused television animation to go corporate, running through phases. One of them being that ultra-masculine action-adventure phase. And regarding this never-ending in competition, Jerry told us, In the 1980s in particular, shows were either based on existing toys or had to be toyatic. That was the term for cartoons like He-Man or GoBots. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we finally find ourselves at Thundercats. A show that, along with its contemporaries, was made for this exact purpose. This probably isn't coming as a surprise to you, but these were television shows second and commercials first. Animated shows were one of toy companies' biggest money makers, so we started to see show after show influencing each other. Companies like Filmation, Sunbow, and Rankin Bass had little other choice than to begin partnerships with huge toy companies like Hasbro, prioritizing how many action figures and playsets they could sell over storytelling or character. Does that take away from these shows, though? Not really, these shows were impactful to a lot of people. But it's still important to acknowledge that these shows mostly came about because they were cynical business decisions made to sell toys. And these shows were often required to follow certain guidelines imposed by business partners, like requirements to include certain toys in the show. Doubly so for the production team of Thundercats, which was in a unique situation at the time of sharing a portion of all profits with Leisure Concepts, the licensing company who developed Thundercats alongside Rankin Bass. Of course, not every show was like this. By the end of the decade, Disney was financially 
financially secure enough that they were able to take risks and do basically whatever the hell they wanted. A practice that wasn't gonna slow down anytime soon with the Disney Renaissance around the corner. But for virtually everyone else, this was the golden marketable toyatic action figure look. Intricately detailed characters whose abs you could grate cheese on, but hindered by stiff and uninteresting animation. And shows like Thundercats, Masters of the Universe, and G.I. Joe were not exceptions, they were the rule. But once we leave the 80s, things start to mellow out for animation. With the economy booming, most shows became less overtly merchandised, and networks became more willing to take risks by surrendering creative control to animators, closer to how things rolled in the 60s. As Mr. Beck told us, the creator-driven cartoons of the 1990s were consciously trying to turn back the clock and return to art styles that used to be, because by the 90s, they were completely forgotten. They wanted their new cartoons to stand apart from what had become the standard cookie-cutter look of television animation. Those animators were influenced by Hanna-Barbera, Bob Clampett's Beanie and Cecil, The Alvin Show, and Roger Ramjet, among others. Efforts like What a Cartoon, started by the Fred in Frederator, Fred Seibert, Hi Fred, were started to showcase animators that would go on to shape the industry in the years to come. And while many shows had more freedom, commonalities could still be seen in their visuals. After all, there was plenty of crossover in the teams of these shows, and artists are greatly influenced by their previous projects, as well as anything that they were exposed to in their youth that resonated with them. But now, here's where things start to really shift. In the new millennium, the industry began to switch to digital animation, as opposed to traditional pencil and paper. And as with any major change, it brought... change. Uh, Alex, you still there? Yes. Uh, I am still there in the same room as you, Jacob. Right next to you. Kind of similar to Hanna-Barbera's innovative, budgeted approach to animation in the 60s, uh, working digitally in the late 90s and early aughts opened up all of these new opportunities for studios once the technology became available. Smaller teams were able to execute bigger projects on smaller budgets, which is objectively a good thing. Web series became a thing. Independent animators were able to make their own cartoons, which never happened before. Newgrounds became a huge huge thing, Happy Tree Friends, and Ego Raptor all started just because working digitally was now possible. Every single day, I am grateful that I get to just sit on a computer and draw and hit Command Z and I don't have to erase anything. The shift to digital animation has skyrocketed efficiency. And in the last few years, this has led animation to focus on areas that until now, Western animation has been sorely needing improvement in. For example, shows these days generally have more dynamic facial expressions compared to back in, oh, I don't know, the 80s. And now that the showrunners of today have grown up with shows like the anime of yesterday, that influence is very plainly seen on the screen. It is so easy to see the influence that anime like Dragon Ball Z, Sailor Moon, and Pokemon have had on Western cartoons being made now. There are so many visual storytelling devices that we have just straight up took from Japanese animation. Creative camera work, ambitious action choreography, and less of a dependency on dialogue to advance the plot. There's also been an increased interest in long season spanning story arcs for shows like Adventure Time, Steven Universe, in season five of Samurai Jack. The Lich is Frieza. TV cartoons have arcs now. They change, they grow, they learn things. That's crazy. Lionel's character sure as hell did not develop at all for all of Thundercats. He didn't learn anything. This doesn't mean that no future production will ever use pencil and paper again. In recent years, where nostalgia for the 80s aesthetic, or at least some warped fictionalized version of it, has come breaking down the door in the form of vaporwave heavy synths and VHS scan lines, let's not count traditional animation out just yet. I mean, there was an entire video game animated in a traditional 1930s style just last year, albeit assisted with digital means. So you can probably see right now that trends in animation can come from all manner of sources, and there's hardly ever a catch-all to explain everything. Hell, even what we just talked about is like the super abridged version. It's like if you took a copy of Ulysses and tried to summarize it in one sentence. But armed with this knowledge, let's now try to tackle what everybody is so up in arms about. These generally simpler character designs that people are lamenting for taking over the entire animation industry. Alex, what's your take on this look? I think it's half stylistic trend and half okay, we gotta make designs that are easy to animate. I guess you can say that designs for shows like Gravity Falls and Gumball are simpler than those of previous decades, but 
whatever. I think that simpler design leads to more potential for cool animation. And I personally would rather see a really sick choreographed action sequence between Jasper and Garnet fighting than I would see a static drawing of Mumra's abs. Although both have their merits. Also, simpler, more flexible designs allow the production team to collaborate in a way that animated television series have never seen before. No cartoon world has ever been as developed as the Land of Ooh and Adventure Time, and the wacky multimedia approach to visual storytelling in Gumball is what keeps it so fresh, exciting, and creative. Neither of these shows would be as open to experimentation if the designs weren't so invitingly flexible to its writers and artists. I'm positive that Thundercats Roar is going to be more ambitious with its character writing, its world building, and its action sequences than the original because the artists are more creatively involved with the production. I think it's also fair to say that the argument that these shows are somehow damaging the industry as a whole is pretty narrow-minded because they're really just a small part of the equation. Yeah, some of them may be flagships, but you don't really have to look very hard to find shows that have a wildly different look to them. Disney's sharper DuckTales redesign showcases an appreciation for its late 80s animation roots while also reinterpreting the comics it's based on. Gumball, as I've previously said on Cartoon Conspiracy, is, in my opinion, one of the most visually inventive shows on television, and Netflix proudly showcases the influence anime has had on Western animation through shows like Castlevania and the Voltron reboot. And that's not even mentioning the wealth of adult animated shows that we haven't even touched on. Even if there are trends that you're not down with right now, there's just so much stuff out there. There's flavors for every taste. There's over the garden wall for people who like beautifully crafted backgrounds. Justice League action for people who like superhero action. There's Archer for people who want a show that's visually a little closer to reality. And there's Rick and Morty for people who like a really cute cartoony approach to sci-fi alien design. And there's all those other shows that have really intentionally crass designs that make your eyes bleed. And I will leave it up to you, Jacob, to decide what stills you will accompany with the previous things that I said. And there's other stuff. Ah, I think I've cut my eye. So does the new Thundercats look like everything else? It definitely shares some design elements with its contemporaries, but as we've discussed, that's not really indicative of a lack of creativity. Based on how the animation industry has evolved in the West, the show is actually pretty well situated to become pretty great. This industry, as with any other art form, ebbs and flows as time goes on, and animators impart their wisdom, allowing others to be inspired by their work. But let's close this outright with some of Jerry Beck's words. I'm excited by all the new individualistic approaches I see. It's okay to use artistic styles by past filmmakers you admire, but build upon them. Every cartoon should be as unique as the person who's making it. Hardly something you can judge from a teaser trailer. Besides, the original shows are still there, and if the industry is a start for reboots as some claim it to be, then there'll probably be another reboot in a few years that you'll feel better about. But for now, let's find a different hill to die on and give these animators a chance. And on the plausibility meter, we're gonna rate the idea that Thundercats Roar is part of some malicious plot to homogenize the animation industry zero Swords of Omen out of five. Anyway, those are our thoughts, our opinions on this whole situation, but do let us know in the comments how you feel about the whole Thundercats Roar deal. Whether you're excited about it or think you're gonna give it a pass or you're waiting to see the show to pass judgment. And I know I'm probably speaking to a vast minority right now, but let's do try to keep it level-headed down there. And before we go, we also want to thank Mr. Jerry Beck and Alex Crocus to the ends of the earth for helping us with this video. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to Channel Frederator and click that little bell icon to join our notification squad. Once again, my name is Jacob. If you want to follow me on Twitter, you can find me under the name The Sandwichy, or you can find me on YouTube under just the regular old name Sandwichy. It's the word sandwich with a Y at the end. I get a lot of questions on how to spell it. And before we go, of course, one last thing. Remember, Frederator loves you.